Hey, Cypher here. I study American violence in the Southwest, and one of the chapters of my dissertation will be on the Border War, specifically the Battle of Ambos Nogales from 1918. That of course means that I've had to learn about the Mexican Revolution, and let me tell you, it's a complicated mess. You have to understand all these characters and their individual motives across a decade of strife. But first and foremost on that list is who the revolution was ultimately against. Porfirio Diaz. Before the revolution, there was the Porfiriato in Mexico, which was 35 years of economic stability, liberal reform, increasing American encroachment, and collapsing democracy, all ruled over by Diaz, Mexico's longtime dictator. So today is about his rise to power, the Porfiriato, and his quick downfall in 1911. This is part of a large collab between history tubers called Project Dictator. So check out the playlist if you aren't already on it to learn about all kinds of different dictatorships. Diaz orders you to. If you're already on there, let's talk about how he went from a liberal revolutionary to needing a revolution to topple him four decades later. Mexicans have mixed feelings about the Porfiriato, hotly debated to the present. Some hate Diaz for being a power-hungry tyrant who sold Mexico to the United States, while others romanticize the time as a golden era unequaled in prosperity for the country. This legacy is formative to Mexican politics today, and I make no attempt here to take a side. Instead, as always, I prefer to move beyond good and evil rather than sitting in judgment. We'd all understand history a hell of a lot better by ambiguating such opinions. After all, judge not lest ye be judged. I am much more concerned about how Diaz's reign led to the revolution. It's a complicated story, as we'll see. Thanks to all my patrons, especially Kevin Butler, for making this happen. Mexico was perpetually in turmoil from their very independence in 1821. Beginning as an empire and quickly revolting to create a republic instead, they never found national cohesion through a clear and fully ratified constitution. This led to a series of wars over that fundamental charter, finally resolving on one in 1857, which emphasized liberalism as in land reform, weakening Catholic control, and federalization. Because of the prevalence of these wars, from the beginning all the way until 1946, most Mexican presidents were prominent military leaders and often used that status to take the presidency. Diaz would be no different. Making matters worse was a series of foreign invasions, including that of their northern neighbor, the United States, which took half of the fledgling country's rebellious northern territories for themselves. But a different invasion halted the implementation of that liberal constitution, one in the nasty late 1850s internecine conflict known as the Reforma. And this invasion molded Porfirio Diaz into a popular hero. In December of 1861, Spain, Britain, and France blockaded Mexico in order to exact repayments of debts. They were emboldened by the fact that the U.S. was fighting a civil war, thereby temporarily halting the Monroe Doctrine that had stopped such European aggression before. France was even more willing to take advantage, and they decided to invade in April, creating a puppet empire supported by the Mexican conservatives. On the 5th of May, a French detachment saw a symbolic defeat at Puebla. Though it was only a minor victory for Mexico, it emboldened the willingness to keep fighting France. And guess who was one of the Mexicans who led this battle? The origin of Cinco de Mayo. <laughs> Porfirio Diaz. With late support from the U.S. after the Civil War, liberals won in 1867 and Diaz made his name. President Juarez withheld power since 1858 because of the French invasion, so Diaz ran against him in 1871, but lost. Diaz claimed that the election was rigged and launched a brief rebellion. He lost that too, but got elected to Congress anyways. 
When Juarez's successor ran for re-election, which was generally frowned upon by Mexicans at the time, Diaz ran against him and lost that too. Just like 71, he launched another rebellion. But after an initial defeat, Diaz returned and won, becoming president by coup. Now Diaz could implement his own form of liberalism, with some influence from positivism, which he called order and progress. But he had to resign the presidency for a year in order to fight other rebellions left over from his coup. When he finished those campaigns, the first thing he did was reformulate the army, so as to better deal with further rebellions and halt conflict along the northern border in order to seek recognition from the US, who withheld it until 1878. The army would become a clear feature of the Porfiriato, but his first term was mostly just trying to put out the fires he ignited. The Plan de Tuxtepec, which Diaz followed to institute the coup, called for the end of presidential re-elections, so he actually didn't seek re-election in 1880. Instead, Diaz's former subordinate, Manuel Gonzalez Flores, became president for a term before Diaz could run again four years later. Gonzalez kickstarted Diaz's hopes for economic development in Mexico. Most importantly were the railroads, the first of which to cross the international border finished in 1882. The problem with this liberalization was that it was open to foreign capital. For instance, that railroad from Huaymas to Nogales was technically created by the Sonora Railroad, but that was actually just a Mexican front for the Santa Fe Railroad, an American corporation. Funny enough, many ventures like that failed miserably often because of the taxes and other requirements on foreign corporations. But Mexicans were more annoyed by foreign ownership than the benefits they reaped. Gonzalez also passed a mining law that allowed foreigners to own topsoil. Despite mining having enriched Mexico for centuries, they couldn't have booms like in the US because of these limits on ownership. Fully liberalized, foreign capital could sweep in and buy up claims. As oil became more popular, that industry also became controlled mostly by foreigners. Some of them even started buying up haciendas. Liberals had fought against three main things prior to Diaz. Haciendas, religion and politics, and centralization. As in, large estates, Catholics who had enormous influence through their large land holdings, and placing authority in the capital of Mexico City rather than the states or municipalities. But the Perfiriados seemed to have forgotten these principles. Instead, it was simply about making Mexico a powerful economy, even if that is simply through foreign control. Following Gonzalez, Diaz became president again in 1884, and this time he stopped following the main issue of the Plan de Tuxtepec, as in no re-elections. Diaz would remain in power until 1911. He'd use that time to continue the liberalization of the economy and use the military to create a Mexican nationalism, thereby creating the political order of liberal positivism. Diaz even surrounded himself with a group of technocrats known as the Scientificos, who advised him on how to create this new order. One of their key contributions was a major push for public schools. It was a way to usurp Catholic control and bring literacy to more Mexicans. Through taxes on foreign investments, Diaz was able to fund a huge amount of infrastructure development, such as roads and waterworks. He also funded sanitation campaigns. With all of this infrastructural growth, Mexico's economy flourished. This was all part of trying to modernize Mexico, but it took force to keep order. Diaz appointed friendly governors, thereby centralizing power. The legislature passed laws that allowed Diaz to imprison journalists, thereby censoring the press. Beyond such restrictions, there was the use of violence. Rurales, as in countryside police, built up during this period. The federal army, then called Federales, stayed small but modernized. Both used conscription, so the presence of Federales and Rurales was onerous to say the least. Diaz hoped that having so many citizens become Rurales or Federales would inspire a sense of nationalism, but it never really did so. Instead, they often abused their power, so conscription and patrols were seen as tyrannical. 
Along with immense foreign control of the railroad, mining, and oil industries, many thought of these forces as being there purely to protect foreign capital, which led to a whole series of conflicts. Diaz got involved with a series of wars over the borders and unification in Central America. Mexico was finally able to throw around its might, and the Federales also had significant power within their borders. Yaqui Indians regularly rose up in defiance of the government, just as the army had managed to build up sufficient defenses against marauding Apaches in 1886, they turned to fighting Yaquis. Sufficiently harassed, a low-level war would continue for decades, including a big uprising a decade later. Along with the ongoing caste war in the Yucatan, Federales always had some Indian war to fight throughout the Porfiriato, but an even bigger concern were revolts. Many thought Diaz kept winning elections only through fraud. Mexicans lost faith in their elections. Caterino Garza loudly proclaimed as such when he launched a revolt from Texas in 1891. Federales eventually defeated him, but only after two years of strife. The United States helped the Diaz regime, which stirred further anger about Americans involved in Mexico. There were several smaller revolts, but a 1906 strike in Canea, Sonora basically prefigured Diaz's downfall. When the American mine company police shot into a crowd of strikers, the strikers turned around and rioted. Rurales were outmatched at first, but then a posse crossed the border from Arizona to quash the revolt until Federales could intervene. More than 20 people died. Another strike in Rio Blanco six months later ended in Federales and Rurales killing even more. Two months after that, Diaz met with President Taft in El Paso, and the event ended abruptly when an assassin was stopped mere feet away from the two heads of state. Beginning in 1906 until well into the revolution, anarchists called Maganistas radicalized the population of the U.S.-Mexican borderlands, keeping up a small insurgency that neither government could quash. Even New York newspapers were calling Diaz a tyrannical dictator by 1908. Things were getting difficult. Diaz claimed that he wouldn't run for re-election in 1910. He threw a bunch of centennial celebrations of Mexican independence, which were supposed to signify the end of his reign as well. But Diaz ran anyway, and he jailed his opponent, Francisco Madero, who escaped to Texas. Just like Garza before him, Madero launched a rebellion from there. But this time, they managed to defeat Diaz, sending him fleeing to the US and eventually dying in Paris. The revolution continued for another decade in his absence, reformulating Mexican politics altogether. But Diaz's dictatorship left an indelible mark on their history, for good or ill. Okay. Most Mexican presidents were prominent m King. Get down. Stop it. Diaz's downfall. Diaz's downfall. Diaz's downfall. Diaz's downfall. Diaz's downfall. 